Good morning. Uh, I'll go ahead and pick on Pastor David. We'll need to make sure that the clock in there is changed a little bit. It's a little bit behind. So, um, I love this weather. Was it last Sunday that it was snowing? Was it just last Sunday? Isn't that crazy? I looked around the yard. There's only, it's hard to find snow, which is nice, and the pens are drying up, so fingers crossed. Calving will be a little drier, a little warmer than the uh, last few years. Um, today, uh, we'll have a choral call to worship to follow, uh, which is the heavens are telling. But first, um, feel free to greet each other, and those on Zoom, wave, unmute yourself, uh, say hi, and make sure you mute yourself uh, once again after you do that. But then uh, after greeting, we'll have the, have the choral call to worship.
Now's time for the responsive call to worship. I will read the, read the light print and the congregation will read the dark. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims God's handiwork. There is no speech, yet their voice goes through, out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. The law of the Lord is perfect, sure, clear, true, and righteous. The fear of the Lord is pure. Let the words and meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. We call out to you as you call us to deeper wisdom. For our opening prayer, um, with the theme of wisdom, I realize it doesn't sound like it, but this is a prayer that uh, always pops in my mind and is likely familiar to you. Uh, it is the Serenity Prayer by Reinhold Niebuhr. Um, so bow with me. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. We will now sing the opening hymn, Man of Sorrows, hymnal worship book number 258.
Good morning. If uh, we have any children here, I'd have them come to the front. And uh, those of you that are at home on Zoom, if you would unmute yourself, I have some questions that you can maybe help with. Um, I chose to come up to the front of the, uh, on top of the pulpit here. It's uh, a little easier to understand me without my mask on. And I have a assistant that will help me down below. So I'm Brent, and this is Cindy. And did you see the sun this morning? It was really nice. Yes. Sometimes we don't see the sun. But, and this is maybe for the older people, I heard a song this morning by the Beatles, and it was Here Comes the Sun. It's all right. The sun always makes everything much better. But the sun gives us a lot of beautiful colors. And if you looked up at the screen before, you saw all the beautiful colors that we have. And, and the theme for today is the deep changing sky, or deep in the changing sky, called called to deep wisdom. And do you know why the sky has so many different colors? No. Anybody know? Okay, well, we have seven different colors because that's what the sunlight is made of. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And do you know what else has those seven different colors? A rainbow. Right, the rainbow, thank you. And Cindy has a, a picture there of the rainbow and, and you can see those seven different colors in there. And now we're going to do a little experiment and we're going to make a rainbow of our own. And we have these colors. We have blue, yellow, green, and red. We don't have all of them, but she's going to put those into that vase and we'll see if we can make a rainbow. One of the reasons that we see these different colors is because they have different wavelengths and they travel at different speeds. Red has the longest wavelength, and I believe it's blue that has the shortest. And you, you probably know better than I do. I'm not much of a scientist, but um, that's why we see the different things. And then when the sunlight reflects off of those um, different colors, then we see them in the sky. And so we'll see uh, how our rainbow comes out here. Okay, she's got blue and now we've got yellow. And this isn't a dangerous experiment. These colors are, it's just water. So those of you who are up close, you should be safe. Okay, our next one is green. Do you see a rainbow, Kaysen? Do you see it starting to form? Yes. And then our last one will be red. We have such beautiful sunrises and sunsets in South Dakota, and we can see them because we have much clearer air, but that's God's um, special art to us. I, I think as we see it, we can't help but love what we see. And there's our rainbow in a vase. What does the rainbow represent to Christians? I have no idea, no clue. Okay, well, then well, thank you for your honesty. Many, many years ago, there's a, a flood of great proportions and it wiped out everything on, on earth. 
And God promised after that that he would never again set a flood of that size. And the rainbow is what uh, we see after rains or something like that. And so that's, that's a promise from God. That's a commitment to us. Wisdom is very much like sunlight. God is the giver of wisdom and uses different ways to teach us wisdom, all of the different colors and light. The Bible teaches us who God is, what God has done for God's people, and to reflect our identity as Christians. God also sends us different people in our lives, our mothers and our fathers and our grandparents, aunts and uncles, teachers, pastors, all those people will teach you um, about who God is and who we are and how we're called to reflect his light. God gives us wisdom through prayer, through different experiences and other revelations. And God wants us to use this in our daily lives to reflect his love and his wisdom. If you'd bow with me for a quick prayer, and I'll let you go back to your seats. Dear God, I would ask that you reveal deep wisdom to each of these children. Just as the sun sends sunlight each day, dear Lord, pour down your wisdom on these children. Amen. Thank you. Here in the sanctuary and at home. Thank you for sharing that with us. Most of you probably could not see Kaysen's wonder as he was watching her pour that in and the different colors. He was, he was very excited. Uh, I was also very excited about we are going pretty heavy with the Brents. Um, last Sunday, worship leader. This Sunday, worship leader. And uh, But I think we pretty much exhausted the Brents in the church. So I think we're, I think we're out. Um, today's... Scripture is found in Proverbs. I'll be reading from the NIV version, and it is Proverbs 1, 1 through 7. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. For attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. For understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Pastor David, I ask you to bring the message. All right, thank you so much. Brent and Brent and Cindy, thank you for your help today. There's nothing like kids in church. There's nothing like them. You got to love them, and uh, you just appreciate them. You keep bringing those kids, and uh, the noise is not going to bother me, that's for sure. Thank you, Heather, for your organ. And uh, very well done there. And uh, I guess, I don't know, if Cal, was that your, the picture of your place? It says Cal's trees or something? Graber trees. Graber trees. Yeah, it said Graber trees. You don't know? <laughs> Who knows? Okay. Well, uh, uh, thank you anyway uh, for uh, Carol for making, making all that possible and all of that. So thank you. Takes a, takes numbers of people our audio visual team takes numbers of people to make uh, a good service uh, a meaningful service i am extremely aware of that and something that we didn't get in the bulletin i believe there is the time change next sunday so don't forget that i believe that's coming up on saturday night is where you usually before you go to bed i guess and so that'll be next sunday and then uh, there were a couple of computer glitches, and uh, I just want you to know that our team was planning to put in the computer 
this past week, but the, the, all the parts didn't come. Uh, so uh, w they will get to that just as soon as they can, but, and maybe the new things that we're putting in there might take care of some of those little glitches that happen from time to time. I certainly don't want to promise that. I don't think they do either, but uh, we hope that. And so it does happen, so we're doing the best we can with what we have here today. So I think let's go ahead and start the message, please. Here we go. Today is the third Sunday of the Lenten season. The purpose of Lent is to prepare our hearts for the Easter week, culminating in the celebration of Christ's resurrection. This year's theme is Deep Calls to Deep. We have spoken on deep relationship in week one and deep commitment in week two. Today, we are going to take the plunge into deep wisdom. To be sure, wisdom is a broad subject throughout scripture and definitely could not be adequately covered in several sermons, not, maybe not even one book. So we're not gonna be able to cover it at, uh, for sure today, but we're gonna try, that will be our task. We will be taking our comments from the book of Proverbs, of course, known as the book of wisdom, and other passages found throughout the Bible in our effort to encourage all of us to grow deeper in wisdom. Okay, let's go ahead and go to the next thing. Uh, thank you, Brent, for reading Proverbs 1, 1 through 7. Let's go to the next thing. And we're gonna kind of look at a working definition of wisdom. Who knows how to write a couple paragraphs on wisdom and define it adequately. That does not do it, but it's a working definition and we're gonna work our way through that maybe. <laughs> I'm gonna try to get back to that definition. I can start reading, I've got it. That's why I bring the old notes here. Okay, here we go. Let's work our way through that, and I think we're gonna work our way through it twice. Um, so let's uh, take a shot at what is wisdom, and this comes from a variety of sources. Wisdom is more than just a collection of factual information. It includes knowing how to conduct oneself <clears throat> in the practical affairs of everyday life, to make wise choices, to do the right thing in relation to others and to have insight into the true nature of things. It is no knowledge carried into practice. Wisdom of this kind can only grow out of an awareness of God and his purpose in the world. Now, this word wisdom is found more than 40 times in Proverbs. And we're gonna get to Proverbs eventually as well, but. Uh, not yet. Let's go back to the, to the, uh, to the definition. I want to go through it again uh, because uh, it, it's, just, it's just important to understand. And again, this is not a full scoped uh, definition. So wisdom is more than just a collection of factual information. You don't get wisdom by uh, uh, memorizing facts or lists of things. We all remember taking biology class, and biology class was a list, lists, lists, list of things. And in theology, uh, they were, when I would take uh, examinations in theology, I would, I would put all those lists down and memorize them, put them on a three by five card and, and memorize them. And, uh, you know, the best I could, I would try to do it, a lit do, use alliteration to memorize and stuff. And so we passed theology class. Be surprised. Most of you are surprised at that, but I did. I passed through theology class and got through. But so it's not wisdom doesn't come by memorizing or by knowing lists of things. It includes that might be a start. That might be part of it, but it includes knowing how to conduct oneself in the practical affairs of everyday life. And that's what Proverbs, the book of Proverbs covers. It covers a multitude of things just occurring in everyday life. And it, it helps you to make wise choices, to do the right thing in relation to others, in relationship with others, decisions you make in your relationship with others. It, it could be husband and wife, father and son, 
uh, parents and children, grandparents and grandchildren, grandchildren and grandparents, uh, employer, employee, and a whole lot of things. Uh, to have insight in the true nature of things. You see, we, we see things, and some people have enough wisdom to see, to have insight into really what is the bottom line and what does this mean for the world as a whole and what does it mean for my world, see? True insight into the true nature of how things work. That's wisdom. Uh, it is knowledge carried into practice. So you need knowledge. You need that, those lists of things. You need to accumulate knowledge in your life of a wide variety of things and issues and, 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 and topics and so forth. Learn as much as you can. Learn that. But that's not all. It starts with that. Then, it, then you carry that knowledge into practice. How can I use this? Now, I taught in public, not public school. I taught, taught in Christian school. And so oftentimes I'd get this, especially in a history class, uh, you get, well, this doesn't pertain to my life today. And uh, that, that is a very, uh, of course, immature way of looking at history. It does apply, uh, but nevertheless, Knowledge carried into practice, how I do my everyday life, how I uh, get up in the morning, what I do in the morning, how I take care of my cattle, how I farm my farm, that wisdom, it takes knowledge, but then wisdom is knowledge applied to your farm, to your industry, to your business, to uh, your vocation, whatever you're doing. You take the knowledge, get as much knowledge as you can, then you apply it to your particular situation. Now, wisdom of this kind, that's going to please God, that's going to do right and well, can only come uh, from an awareness of God and his purpose in the world. So you see why you need to know much in the Bible, much, much, much. The whole, the whole scope of New Testament and Old Testament and how things work together and you need to understand the purpose of every book that you, every book of the Bible is 66 books. What is the purpose of the book and how that how the book flows and what it means and all of that. Uh, that will add to your understanding of who God is, what his purposes are in the world, and how that affects you. See, all of that is accumulated wisdom in your life. And, uh, and the, this book, uh, this word, Chachma, is the Hebrew word for wisdom. That is found over 40 times in the book of Proverbs. I didn't bother to count what well, I counted, but it's uh, 40, 41, 42, 43. Sometimes the word is found twice in the same passage, so I didn't kind of get all those things. So it's over 40, it's at least 40, somewhere between 40 and 45. Now let me just say this too about the, about the book of Proverbs, um, uh, that I've done a lot of study on the book, I've taught the book, I've taught it in church settings, I've taught it in school settings and so forth, and, uh, and all of that. But uh, in, in those verses that were read this morning, one through seven of Proverbs, there are at least nine, nine Hebrew words uh, that pertain to wisdom. Uh, Hachma is one of them, but there's many more. So wisdom, understanding, intelligence, insight, prudence, discretion, discernment, and uh, learning, all of those, that was only eight, all of those are used in just those first seven verses of Proverbs 1. Now, I, re I wrote a little bit uh, called Connected, I guess, if you get the bulletin. It's not in our paper bulletin, but it is in the, as you send the, we send the bulletin out on email, it is there. And those, those uh, things are mentioned in the verses 1 through 7, the purpose of the book of Proverbs. I encourage you to read that. There's a whole lot more to that. But let's go on. The supremacy of wisdom. Uh, my major points today are going to be supremacy of wisdom, source of wisdom, securing wisdom, and the success of wisdom. But let's look at the supremacy of wisdom. Proverbs 4, 7 says this, wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is the principal thing. The wise man said, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. So, and so that's a different word, a little different. They're related, wisdom and understanding and knowledge. They're all kind of related to each other, but they have their own unique parts of them as well. 
So wisdom is the principal thing. And that word principal means the choicest, the finest, the chief, the first, the principal thing, attribute you should get. Now you say, I thought salvation was. Well, of course it is. But that's, that wasn't the purpose of when, Pro, when Solomon wrote this particular thing. Uh, he, was that, he wanted to talk about wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing in life. Get wisdom. And with all you're getting, get understanding. Get it, get it, get it. He wants you to have it, I think. And especially to the Hebrew mind of that day. He is, uh, he is writing out of a Hebrew mindset. It's different than the Greek mindset of the New Testament. So the Hebrews placed a lot of emphasis on your everyday life, on your, on your land, on your property, and, and things of that nature. Uh, uh, Israel's, Israel's whole life was related to the land in which they were living. And, uh, and their everyday affairs of living on that land in relationship to God. That is the Hebrew mindset in a nutshell, in a very small nutshell. And uh, so forth. So, uh, so get wisdom, get wisdom, get wisdom. Do everything you have from the mindset of wisdom. Get it. Don't let it go. Accumulate it. That's why they, they uh, talk about people of older age have wisdom. Uh, we talk about, and even in the Bible says gray hair uh, is related to wisdom. And the reason it says that is because as the older you go, the more wisdom you should have accumulated. And uh, so start when you're young to get wisdom, get knowledge, understanding, intelligence. Learn all you can about the sciences and the arts and the history and math and all of that stuff. Learn that stuff. And then you use it to, and you apply it with wisdom to your life and your lifestyle. And, Pro, and, and Solomon would say, if you do these things, your life is going to be more complete, more prosperous, more enjoyable, more happy, more pleasing to God if you live the life on that basis. And so that is somewhat the idea of the whole book of Proverbs. Live your life in that basis and you will have a better time of it. Well, let's, let's look at this guy who wrote this. And uh, we don't have this written out, but I'm going to read for you. For you, 1 Kings 4. Starting with verse 29, and let's look at the guy who wrote this book. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure and breadth of mind, amazing, like the sand on the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all other men, wiser than Ethan the Ezraite and Heman and Kolkol and Darda the sons of Mahol, and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He also spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. He spoke of trees from the cedar uh, that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. He spoke also of beasts and of birds and of reptiles and of fish. And the people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon and from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. We know the history of there that Solomon, God appeared to Solomon in the night when Solomon became king and God says, ask me anything and I'll give it to you. And Solomon could have asked for riches and, and uh, you know, large lands and all that stuff. The word Shalomon, Solomon, means peace, and he did have peace in his land. He could have asked for peace. He could have asked for a lot of things, but he said, Lord, uh, how can I rule this so great a people, so many people? I need your knowledge and your wisdom to rule these people. And then God gave him that knowledge. He gave him that wisdom. He appeared and he told him again, I have given you what you have requested. So when we re what I read about Solomon is extremely unusual. I don't know of anybody who has that kind of wisdom, whoever did, except Solomon. And extremely unusual. You remember that is a special gift from God that Solomon had. We're not going to try to match Solomon's wisdom. We won't be able to do that. But Solomon is extremely wise in the administration 
of, of his, of, of, of his uh, country, of his government. Extremely wise. And he, he would look at trees and birds and fish and he would get a lesson out of that that he could apply to life. An amazing man. And uh, so God gave him that very unusual man. And so he wrote the book of Proverbs. And so be good for you to get a hold of that book. Well, you do have a hold of it, of course. And study the book of Proverbs uh, and uh, it, much insight. And it's also helpful to take a variety of, of uh, Bible translations and look at it from a different translation. And it, there's some insight into that if you can do that. So that's the supremacy of wisdom. It's the greatest thing Solomon says you could ever have. All right, let's go to the next thing. We're going to look at the source of wisdom. Obviously, the source of wisdom is from God. I think you could pick that up with what Solomon, uh, what happened with Solomon and, and all of that and how we describe wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1, 20 to 21 that we have written for you. Where is the one who is wise, says the Apostle Paul? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? I should have had that highlighted. Wisdom of the world. You see, the world system has its own wisdom. So there is such a thing as the wisdom of the world. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. You see, you can't get to know God through the study of the sciences and the arts and all of that. You, your, your, your intellect might be, it might be triggered, your desire might be triggered to know God, but wisdom, worldly wisdom alone will not lead you to God. It takes a divine in intervention of God's source of wisdom, that is the Word of God, and of course Christ the Son of God. And uh, so in order for you to have that you need to know that Christ. But the world has its own wisdom. And you've heard of people in the world who don't believe God's word and they do this, that, and another thing. They explain away the miracles, they explain away this and that in the Bible. You've heard that, I would guess you have. I've heard that most all my life. And uh, uh, that's the wisdom. They actually believe that. They really believe that. I don't know if anybody's, anybody uh, paid them to say that, but they actually believe that. That's the wisdom of the world that so many things didn't really happen and we can explain them scientifically and it probably really doesn't matter a whole lot whether you believe the literal things of the Bible probably really doesn't matter a whole lot. The main thing is that you get some kind of little lesson to help you in your everyday life. Well, that's the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of God says you need to believe those things. Those things are true. God's word says they are true and they are true. That's God's wisdom. So the world has its own set of wisdom and, and all of that. So you, you have to be extremely uh, discretionary, use discretion on all the information you receive in your lifetime. And uh, there is good wisdom and bad wisdom. Now, he said, it's interesting that Paul would say, and when he talks about wisdom of the Greeks and they, they excelled in wisdom, uh, though, though the world had its own wisdom, they did not know God through wisdom. So the wisdom they had wasn't wisdom at all, at least not enough to know God. Now, I like this last part. It pleased God, though, through the foolishness or the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. The world in their wisdom would not like me. They the worldly wise people will not come to church to listen to a gospel message. They will not say, wow, I really want the word of God. Now, I hope, I hope you people don't take this wrong. There is a system, there is a worldly system that is uh, spoken throughout the New Testament. There is a system of the world. They have their own God, they have their own desires and all of that. They have their own wisdom. And very few of them will really seek the word of God and the wisdom that comes from God. I'm not designating anybody, so don't, don't write me and say, boy, you shouldn't have said that, uh, and all of that. The world does not, by wisdom, seek God. When a person seeks God, it's because God has worked in their hearts and lives. And it is the foolishness of the preaching of the word 
to save those who believe. That is why I preach. And that's not the only reason. Uh, but I've learned that since God, uh, I believe God designated me, called me, however you want to use it, to preach. And so I have learned that that is a great uh, reason why a person preaches, is to save those who believe. So you preach the saving message of Jesus Christ because that's what I'm supposed to do. That's just part of my job description from the New Testament. So, and, and God has chosen through the folly, the, the, the world calls this foolishness. They wonder why you, why they say, why in the world do those Christians go to church? It's the most boring place I've ever seen. Now you don't believe that, I hope. Uh, but, uh, but that's what the world says. They say, why in the world do they do that? And uh, they're not all going to turn TV on to the religious programs, you know, and listen to guys preach on TV. They're not going to do that. They think that's, a, that's the biggest waste of time they could ever do. But what they don't know is that God has chosen that method, the proclamation of his word, the communication of his word to save people. Okay, that's enough. There's a world, worldly wisdom. Let's go to the next thing. Now, again, from the world, James 3. We're going to look at this verse after a while. But he says, Who is wise and understanding among you by his good conduct? Let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, I hope you don't. But if you do, do not boast and be false of the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. Well, then what kind is it? If it didn't come from God, where did it come from? Here's what he says. But it is earthly. It is unspiritual. It is demonic. Wow. That's putting it pretty bold, isn't it? There is a wisdom from above, and then there's a wisdom that's earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. That's the kind of wisdom that causes trouble. That's the kind of wisdom that causes jealousy and selfish ambition and all of that stuff. So there is a wisdom from the world. Let's go to the next thing. There's also the wisdom from God. 1 Corinthians 1, 24. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ himself is the wisdom of God. James three seventeen. By the way, the book of James... Some people call that the Proverbs of the New Testament. I've heard that phrase used. So. But James says this, but the wisdom from above. There we go. There is a wisdom from God. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. We're going to look at each one of those points in just a few minutes. But let's go to the next point, the securing of wisdom. Proverbs 9, 10 says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. I like that word, of course, the fear of the Lord. What does that mean, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? Well, I don't know all the meaning of that. God wrote it and I'm gonna believe it, but. But let me throw something out to you. I think this word fear in the Bible uh, can be used two ways, and maybe more than that, but uh, I understand it in two ways. Number one, you've heard of a healthy fear of the Lord. That means that there is a respect for his awesome power. You've heard of people say, well, you got to put the fear of the Lord in him. That's what that means. It, whoa, there's God, and here's me, and man, I better be careful what I do, what I say, what I think. He's God and I'm me. I'm going to fear the Lord. And there's nothing wrong with that. The scriptures would teach that kind of fear. And then there's another part of the fear of the Lord, which is a reverence for his glorious, wonderful person. And that brings about a sense of worship. The other brings about a sense of warning. Be careful what you do fear the lord don't just assume that you can do whatever you want whenever you want wherever you want it will catch up to you fear the lord that's a warning but then fear the lord have reverence and respect for his wonderful glorious person 
that we know in the person of Jesus Christ and that we sing about and all of that, that produces then a sense of worship. The one produces a sense of warning, the other produces a sense of worship. So there's a two-pronged uh, understanding of the fear of the Lord. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And uh, I would guess that kind of means that first uh, one, but uh, maybe when we, we get to heaven, I'll ask Solomon. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You know, fear God for who he is and uh, what he's done, the magnificent power of God. And, and try to learn from that, that wonderful person. It's the beginning. Start there. And the knowledge of the Holy One is inside. 1 Corinthians 1.30, And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. We're in that part of the securing of wisdom. It comes through the fear of the Lord. It comes through the person of Jesus Christ. He became to us wisdom. We all know about the righteousness that we got when we received Christ about the sanctification, we've heard of all of that, about the redemption that we have in Jesus. But have you thought about the wisdom that we have when we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior? So you have access, you and I, those of us who know Christ, we have access to wisdom from God through the person of Christ. Because we have Christ, we have access to that wisdom and then let's go to the next thing. The success of wisdom. We looked at that verse earlier. And uh, this is the King James, New King James, I believe. And we read that. Uh, and we're going to look at this. That last phrase, uh, sentence where it says, The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality without hypocrisy. Let's quickly go to those words. There they are. There it is. Okay, we're going to look at those eight words, not in a lot of detail. They don't need a lot of detail, really. Now, you can pretty much understand all those as well as I can. So the wisdom that is from above, the characteristic, if you have wisdom that is from above, uh, this, they, these characteristics should be somewhat a part of your life. Uh, they're pure. What would that mean in, as far as my life is concerned? Well, it means upright. It means good. It means holy in life's pursuits and purposes. That's wisdom from above. So that would talk about your, if it was a young person, that would talk about uh, the kind of career you might want to choose, you might want to look for. The kind of career that would be in line with God's wisdom. Holiness in life's pursuits and purposes. And then peaceable, uh, what would that mean? Well, peace with others, obviously. A peaceable life. Wisdom gives you a life of, of peace with others. You're not always rancoring. You're not always fighting. You're not always disagreeing and arguing. And this is my viewpoint. And if you don't like it, uh, uh, there's the, the back door or whatever. You know, that, that is not wisdom from above. That might be wisdom from below, but it's not wisdom from above. It is having that ability to live at peace with others, with wives and husbands and children and all of that, flowing from a pure lifestyle. Uh, wisdom from above is also characterized by a gentle, mild, inoffensive, reasonable kind of life that people say, well, that man or that woman, they're gentle. They're, they're not so offensive. They don't really offend you when you talk with them. They're very easy and nice to talk with. They're very gentle. They're very, it's, it's a pleasure to talk with them. And then easily entreated means just a little bit of the same thing. Easy to talk to, easily entreated. When I entreat you, that means I'm, I, I'm, I want to talk with you, ask you for something and so forth. Uh, so you, you, and a person that's easy to talk to, compliant, they're not so rigid. This is it. There is no other. I said it, and that's it. That's the only thing. I said it, and that's all. That's not wisdom from above. Wisdom from above is that part of your lifestyle. You work with people. You try to see their point of view. You try to 
a reason with them. And I think that word is easily persuaded when wrong. And if you're wrong, you say, I was wrong. I was wrong. Sorry, I was wrong. You're right. I didn't see that. You've got good insight into that. And I, I've said that many times to people. Nobody is smart and has all the answers. And uh, I, I'm at the end of the line on that one. But uh, so there are people that are smart. And, uh, you know, down through the years, working with churches and, and groups, uh, committees, I'm thinking of the word committees, working with committees, I've just sat back in all kinds of different churches, just kind of sat back and marveled. Why didn't I think of that? You know, there's a committee, three or four people, and somebody comes up with something, and I think, to them, why didn't I think of that? I'm not as smart as I thought I was when I walked in the room. And you, ha you have respect for people that have a little different, little different angle on things, and that's something good about committees. It really is. Uh, so uh, then merciful, a person that's compassionate and kind, that kind of wisdom. Uh, good fruits uh, out of a person's life comes just. He's a just person, uh, an a, a honest person, a benevolent person kind actions towards others that comes out of god's wisdom uh, number seven impartial towards others he's not uh, uh what would you say partial uh what are the word we use today i don't know bigoted uh we use several other synonyms i can't think of them off the top of my head you kind of know what that means you're, you're not that way you treat everybody like you treat everybody with respect no matter their color their creed their religion uh, you, you treat them with respect. They are people, and uh, so you treat them with respect. Maybe you want to win them to Christ. Okay, that's, that's another thing. But you better treat them with respect as people who they are. So you're impartial towards people. And then no hypocrisy. You're sincere. You don't try to put on a front. You don't try to put on airs. You told, don't try to make people think that you have something that you really don't that you're somebody special, that you have unusual skills, talents, abilities, whatever. Uh, you're sincere. You don't try to put on a show, no pretense. That's what James says is the result of the accumulation of wisdom from above. That's the kind of person that has walked with the Lord over the years and has accumulated his wisdom and his knowledge. That kind of person is becoming more like Jesus Christ, and Christ is our wisdom, of course. So let me just close the service with this thought. Wisdom starts with Christ and the Word, but it goes on from there. It starts with Christ and the Word. Start it right there. Christ and the Word of God. Now, it accumulates more and more and more and more, but you must start with Christ and the word. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I want to thank you for uh, this time we could talk about wisdom. It is not an easy subject to talk about. Uh, it's, it seems to be vast. It seems to be wide. It seems to be deep. It's, it can be shallow and deep at the same time. <laughs> and all of that, Lord, it, it, it's, it's hard to get a hold of like grabbing a little bit of jello it's hard to get a hold of and hang on to and figure out always what it is it's hard for us to kind of figure out where we're at in that whole scale of things and how you would if you were to come down and grade us on our accumulation of wisdom and have the life that we're living if it's a wise kind of a life uh, it's hard for us to kind of grade ourselves or judge ourselves from time to time but this is a start today, Lord, and the book of Proverbs is a great place to go. And I pray that you have piqued an interest in us to move forward in so many areas of our Christian life. And this is just one area of the Christian life. And uh, uh, Solomon did say wisdom is the principal thing and we should get it. So, Lord, help us to take it to heart and to move forward in that area as you lead us and guide us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor David. We will now do words of confession and insurance, and in the middle, 
is a time of silent meditation. The questions are listed there. Um, how is God calling me to wisdom? And what area of my life needs wisdom? So in the middle, I will pause, and uh, that will be a time where you can meditate on those questions. The symbolism that we're using is the stone. And in the Bible, stones have <clears throat> a lot of great symbolism, as well as are part of so many different uh, Bible stories, whether it's the stone tablets, the stone pillars, or stones gathered uh, from the water that represent the 12 tribes of Israel. David gathers stones to battle Goliath. Stones represent a firm foundation. They were used as weapons to kill uh, those that had done, were judged to have done wrong, also to kill early uh, Christians. The stone was rolled away uh, when Jesus' resurrection happened. The stone is a way of connecting us to God's creation. And most importantly, the stone represents a connection to God. If you have one available, I uh, encourage you to use it as a focus as you meditate on those questions. Join with me in the words of confession and assurance. Deep calls to deep. We call to you from the depths of our hearts. We confess when we have settled into sameness, forgetting the rhythms of the heavens, ignoring the rhythms of justice. We confess when we have not looked up into the eyes of a neighbor into your word that still lives. Deep calls to deep you call to us from the depths of your love. Calling us to deep wisdom, we come to you, God.
We've now come to time uh, for offering and sharing. Today's offering is for MCC and the Sunday School offering is for Salem Sunday School. Um, and children's offering this quarter is for Oyate Concerned School. If you have offering with you, you're welcome to leave it in the plates in the narthex. If you uh, would like uh, to drop it off at another time, you can uh, leave it here at the church or you can mail it in as well. Um, Want to welcome sharing and prayer requests. Uh, first, I'll open it up to those present. Uh, if you'd come forward and use the microphone so we can all hear. Um. If there aren't any in person here, we'll open it up to Zoom. Do want to make sure and point out to you all of the um, prayer list items that are in the bulletin, some wonderful Thanksgiving items and requests, so keep those uh, in mind. But uh, anyone on Zoom? Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Paul Balzer. I just wanted to give everybody a brief update from the things that uh, Church Council has been working on, especially as it pertains to our COVID guidelines. Um, <clears throat> councils worked on uh, our and up, get, putting out an update, a little bit of an updated guidelines, and you will be receiving those by email and in the next day or two. Um, one question I get quite often is, um, are we discussing, are we looking at our guidelines in response to the COVID pandemic? And the answer to that is yes. Church Council has been working on those at just about, if not every meeting, we have a time to discuss what, what our guidelines are and evaluate and discuss our responses at just about every meeting. Um, vaccines are becoming more available and this is really promising news. Um, looking ahead, um, one of the things that we plan on opening up first will be um, Sunday school classes, in-person Sunday school classes for both children and adults. Um, we're still working out details with that, but most likely that that will be like one class of each, a class for adults and a class for children to start with. Our tentative timeline, of course, <clears throat> this will be adjusted as conditions change, but our tentative timeline we're looking at will be June for that. Outside of that, everyone's really eagerly anticipating the returning to a normal church life, and we'll slowly be able to get closer to that reality as more and more people become vaccinated. Thank you. Yes. This is Kay, and I um, just wanted to let you know I have six treatments left, so I'm on the downswing of this process, so I'm really excited about that. Um, I feel pretty good. I'm a little more tired this last half of, of the treatment, but nothing too crazy. I'm still pretty, pretty good energy level, so I'm really grateful for that. So thank you again for your support, for your prayers. Um, like I say, getting closer. Thanks. This is Janver. Oh, uh, this is Janver. I would want to remind you about the annual meeting for Swan Lake Camp today at four o'clock. I'm not sure I'm coming through, but I can't tell for sure. Um, if you haven't called camp to find a, whether well, you I may go to camp to be in person, they're expecting most people to join via Zoom. Last Sunday's bulletin said that you should call the contact camp for the login information. When that is true, you may also contact me either by phone or email or even after the worship service through the Zoom on the chats here. We could do that if you have the information for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, 
For our prayer time, we will begin with silent prayer. Uh, once again, keep in mind our items in the bulletin and uh, items that were shared uh, this morning. After, at the end of the prayer, I will lead us in the Lord's Prayer and we will use debts and debtors. Please bow with me. Dear Lord, thank you for the beautiful weather you've blessed us with this week, the opportunity to get outdoors, fresh air, and the sign of spring and new life there is to come. We ask that you comfort those that uh, have experienced loss, whether it be in their health, in the loss of a loved one, the loss of mobility or any other type, Lord. We thank you for the blessings you give us daily, even though we may not acknowledge them. The gifts that you so freely give us, may we use those to your glory. Lord, help us to come to you in openness and honesty, sharing our struggles, sharing our fears, Lord, thank you for this community, for this body of believers. Thank you so much for this opportunity to worship together, to hear the words that you have given Pastor David. Help us to seek your wisdom, to seek knowledge and understanding, and put it into practical use for your glory. And I will pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before I introduce the closing hymn, uh, I wanted to make one mention uh, after Pastor David's sermon. He encouraged us to use multiple translations as we look at passages in the Bible. And if you noticed uh, the many verses that he uh, shared with us this morning, he had different translations that he was using. Having all those Bibles on hand is difficult, and many of us probably do not, but uh, if you enjoy going on the internet, there is a website called BibleGateway.com, and you can select from, I don't know, 50, 100 different Bible translations, and it's just a great way to easily click on your verse you want, click on the, the uh, type of uh, Bible you want to read it from, read it. You can just quickly click another one instead of having to search and search and search. Uh, so um, uh, thank you for encouraging us to see how it's translated differently. And yeah, sometimes a passage sticks out to us uh, in a different way, especially when we've been reading it a certain way from childhood. So just something to keep in mind, and that's BibleGateway.com. Our closing hymn will be uh, number 250, Beneath the Cross of Jesus in the Hymnal Worship Book.
The changing sky speaks about the larger rhythms of life. The moons and seasons that dance over the horizon reflect the language of the infinite. And when we notice our own smallness in relationship to the sky's expansiveness, only then do we begin to be wise. Go into this week in search of deep wisdom. Go with humility. Amen.